Hi, Lily. Hi, Anna. Get ready. <laughs> I hear the new PM has a bold plan to solve Britain's energy woes. Okay, what's the plan? Gaslighting! <laughs> <laughs> And there'll be more on political gaslighting in this episode very soon. <laughs> you did it. You did find the one good gaslighting joke. <laughs> I was like, this is actually all right. This is quite, this is topical. This is relevant. We'll go with this one. Very topical, actually. Yes. <laughs> Not that you and I would ever get political ever. Oh, no. <laughs> in case you're confused, we always start and end with a dad joke. If you find really bad dad jokes, really cringy ones, please send them to us. We love them. Hi, I'm Anna. And I'm Lily. And this is Liliana's Pre-Read Media Take. The podcast where we analyse and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> For today's movie, I'm not laughing because this is funny. I'm just laughing because this is so much. But we just wanted to mention the trigger warnings up front because of the title. You know this, but there's a lot. So this includes murder, domestic violence, emotional manipulation, and we dive into some discourse around gaslighting. Also mentioning things here up front, neither one of us is a mental health professional. Yep. And yeah, so we will be looking at these issues from a culture perspective. We will analyze the media that focuses on the terms and we talk about the movie, but we're not giving people tips or anything like that. No, definitely not. So... So yes, today we'll mainly be focusing on the 1944 film Gaslight, which was directed by George Cukor and written by John Van Druten, Walter Reich and John L. Balderston. It stars Charles Boyer, Ingrid Bergman, Joseph Cotton and Angela Lansbury in her film debut. It is hard to say those names because you have Charles Boyer is French and then Ingrid Bergman is... Wait, what is Ingrid Bergman? Dutch? Swedish. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You know what I mean? Okay, how do I say this name versus that name? Is it Charles Boyer or Boyer or... I don't know because he worked in America and Americans will Americanize any name, so I'm sure... Boyer, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure people called him Boyer. <laughs> so the film was adapted from a 1938 play of the same name, written by British playwright and novelist Patrick Hamilton. There was also a 1940 British film adaptation of the play, directed by Thorold Dickinson. The 1944 version was a big budget remake with more glamorous stars. It was the most widely watched and popular of these earlier adaptations and is generally the one most people refer to and is the one that we'll be focusing on today. Yeah. And as most people are probably aware, the film's title has been denominalized and that just means turned into a verb, which is used in psychology and popular culture. And this is one of the things that we'll be discussing in this episode. But first... <laughs> so if you ever wondered, hey, Gaslight, where does that come from? We're going to break it down for you today. But first, we're going to do a summary of the plot in case you haven't seen the film. Yeah. Yeah. And make sure you stick around until the end of the podcast when we'll be giving you recommendations of media that we've been enjoying recently. So in Victorian England, a young girl named Paula is being taken away from Thornton Square to Italy after the murder of her aunt, a famous opera singer, Alice Alquist. And while training in Italy to also become an opera singer, Paula suddenly falls in love with the accompanying piano player, Gregory. And despite the trauma of finding her murdered aunt there, Paula fulfills Gregory's wish to live in a house in London and they move back to Thornton Square. Upon arriving, Paula finds a letter that enrages Gregory and they put all of Alice's old furniture into the attic, supposedly turning a new chapter on Paula's trauma. And Gregory hires a cook called Elizabeth and a maid called Nancy, whom he warns about Paula being particular and highly strong. He gifts Paula this brooch which she seemingly loses at the Tower of London. And she starts hearing footsteps overhead and sees the gas lights dimming when no one else is around, but no one can corroborate her reality. So more and more things go missing and Gregory blames Paula and her seemingly worsening mental health. Mm -hmm. But a young Scotland Yard officer named Brian recognizes Paula. This happens before this happens at the Tower of London. Through her resemblance to Alice Alquist, her aunt, and takes interest and notices irregularities in the murder case of the aunt and also 
irregularities in the household, currently in Thornton Square, which he enters trying to pull Paula out of Gregory's created reality. And together they figure out that Gregory is actually Serge's Bauer, mm. the murderer, the man who wrote the letter that Paula found when moving in. He was after Alice Alquist's jewels and moved the furniture into the attic to be able to search for them in secret. And his turning on the light in the attic was the reason the gaslight dimmed in Paula's room. <laughs> they confront Serge slash Gregory in the attic and he, with his back against the wall, admits to deceiving Paula from the very beginning. Thank you. Very succinct and <laughs> well done summary there. Thank you. So Lily, our podcast is called Pre-Read Media Take. Would you tell us what is pre-read? Where does that come from? Yeah, of course. So yeah, pre-read and pre-read text. The term pre-read text was coined by YouTuber Rowan Ellis, and it describes when you haven't engaged with the source material of a story or piece of media, but you have a strong sense of what it is about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material. These adaptations create a kind of cultural consciousness of story, characters, images, concepts, etc., which might have very little or even nothing to do with the original source material, and instead all come from adaptations that have come after that original like text was created. Yeah. And today we'll also be talking more generally about adaptations, and I'll talk about which text we're talking about when we talk about those things. Good example of pre-read text are Sherlock Holmes, for example, or Pirates, because these are things that the original text you may not have read, but you have an image in your mind of what that looks like, because it's been adapted so many times, and that's why adaptation theory is so important when talking about this as well. So, what is gaslighting, though? Anna, can you tell us? <laughs> Very simplistic way. <laughs> so, we wanted to generally look at the official definition from mental health professionals. And so, we looked at the dictionary of the American Psychological Association, and they define it as a, well, verb. And it means to manipulate another person into doubting their perceptions, experiences, or understanding of events. They also say it is usually considered a colloquialism. Mm. That's important. Keep that in mind for later, though occasionally it is seen in clinical literature referring, for example, to the manipulative tactics associated with antisocial personality disorder. The Take, which is um, a YouTube channel that analyzes pop culture, breaks gaslighting down into two key aspects, which I think is quite important. Yeah. So the first aspect being kind of manipulation, and the second aspect being how the manipulating person presents as charming to others, so that their manipulation is less visible making it harder for the victim to be believed or to believe themselves. The YouTube channel SciShow also highlights that while there have been different understandings of why people gaslight over the years, today it's generally understood to be about power and control. And I guess the resurgence of kind of the term gaslight, you often see it in ideas about political gaslighting. And the takes key example of this would be Trump's inauguration in 2017 and his claim about the size of the crowd being like 1 million to 1.5 million people and then being far larger than what other sources said was the size of the crowd at the time. And this led to a spike in Google searches around gaslighting. And it's through this gaslighting and feeding false narratives to the press that creates a sort of sense of chaos and confusion, which makes people easier to control. Because if people don't know what's going on, then it's easier to control what's happening to them, if that makes sense. Yeah, who is right? And does this need to be debated? And then the debate itself becomes part of the narrative. Mm. How big a crowd was. <laughs> So that's gaslighting in a nutshell. Because the term gaslighting has such a broad usage across many different contexts, including political gaslighting, we've talked about interpersonal gaslighting, we'll talk a bit more about institutional gaslighting as well later yeah. on, we thought it would be interesting to delve into the term from the perspective of adaptation theory. So gaslight already starts its life as a kind of interplay between three texts. From the beginning, it's already got this very quick legacy of adaptation. So you have the play, like we talked about, the British film, and then most famously the American film. I think it suggests that this story resonated at the time to have two adaptations in such quick succession, although the UK one is pretty unknown. It is on YouTube, though, for anyone who wants to watch it. Yeah, <laughs> be our guest. Go enjoy that. But I think that demonstrates that this idea of gaslighting, or even just a story around gaslighting, doesn't just resonate with a 21st century audience who are interested in gaslighting as displayed in the movie. There's also this contemporary audience in 19, late 1930s, early 1940s, who are interested in what has become known as gaslighting. Which makes sense given the politics of the time, mm. right? Yes. And then if we look at the longevity of the film and how 
it's still quite a well-known film in popular culture today. So one of the reasons that might be is that with the American film, it had quite a lot of big names involved who either were already quite famous, such as Ingrid Bergman, or kind of went on to be quite famous, such as Angela Lansbury, and kind of yeah. re- that retroactively brings quite a lot of fame to the film and might be a reason people watch it. But probably most significantly, most people only know about this movie because of the term. The reason I know about this movie is because people talk about how oh, the term gaslight comes from this film. And so there's this chicken and egg sort of situation. The term seems to kind of take on a life of its own, as there's this interesting interplay between popular culture and popular discourse on the one hand and psychological discourse on the other. As pointed out by SciShow, the term gaslighting was used in a psychological paper as early as the 1960s. And there were more key uses of this term within psychology in the 80s and 90s. And, and then we see a resurgence in its use in popular culture in the 21st century. So again, you see this term moving from a piece of pop culture into the psychological discourse, back into pop culture as psychological discourse. And if we look at the American Psychological Association's definition, is it even considered a psychological term anymore? It's in this sort of quite uncertain space and no one's quite sure where it stands within these discourses. It's refracted between them all. We did find this really fascinating thinking mm. about it. There was a play that was then turned into a movie, which then mm. became a psychological term. And then it's went back into pop culture because of the way that it was being discussed in terms of the politics of, for example, Donald Trump. So it's jumped back and forth between culture and psychology. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think seeing it in that way, I think it's quite interesting to analyze it from an adaptation theory perspective. Yeah. And if we're looking at particularly representations in media, like how we can analyze that through an adaptation theory lens. So looking at adaptation theory, I tend to take quite a lot of what I'm talking about from Julie Sanders's adaptation and appropriation. And in this text, Sanders argues that when looking at a story or piece of media with a history of adaptation, it's important to not just look at the source text as the original fixed and true version of the text, but to see these adaptations as, quote, a single work refracted through different art forms, all of which are conceivably perceived as equal in the eyes of the user, end quote. I really like that because it allows you to both compare, but also not to put one thing on a pedestal. Yeah, and I think that's, it just seems a much more realistic way of understanding adaptation because realistically, you know, not everyone's going to have seen an original. Or if you're coming at it as an audience member and not as, I don't know, an academic who will have to have studied every single version of a text, it's like you're much more likely to have come across, yeah, these later adaptations of kind of an or- original source. And that means your interpretation of that story or narrative or idea is going to be very different than if you'd started it from the beginning and it shouldn't just be seen as that kind of one progression. Also, the original just might not be, not just accessible to the larger public, but Mm. might just not exist anymore. True, yeah. So many stories are based on myths and legends and a lot of those spread through the population through storytelling. Mm. And if no one ever wrote this down, that there isn't the fixed true version in the first place. Yeah, But yes, Deborah Cartmel, who's another person who's interested in adaptation theory, and theorises about it, sorts adaptation into kind of three broad categories that overlap with each other. Often an adaptation will kind of include all three of these, two of these, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So these three broad categories are transposition, commentary, and analogue. So transposition is probably the most obvious form of adaptation, so that's just adaptation between different mediums. So say like a book being adapted into a film, and it's all about the medium. Commentary is, quote, Achieved most often by offering a revised point of view from the original, adding hypothetical motivation or voicing what the text silences or marginalises, end quote. So it's about that interpretation that happens when a text is adapted and arguably always happens, even if it's supposed to be a faithful adaptation to that original text, because you're choosing what parts of that text you want to be bringing into your adaptation and kind of making important Yes, yeah, so that's commentary. And then finally, we have analogue, which is kind of as an example, what Emma would be to Clueless. So analogue um, adaptations bear only the slightest relevance to the source text. And Cartmel thinks that it's useful to think about how much knowledge of the source is required to understand the analogue adaptation. Or is it merely enriching to understand that source material? And I think gaslighting as a term falls into this category where it's like you don't necessarily need to have seen the film or know that much about the film, but you might still have an understanding of what the term gaslighting is. And it's interesting where it falls within that analogue category, the term gaslighting. That also sounds a lot like pre-reading. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Just another definition of pre-reading. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So if we look at, this, uh, at gaslight as a story and a text and a term, 
We can see the transposition category in how it turns from a title of a film and arguably the contents of the film into a psychological term and then into a pop culture term. And so there's that transposition between genre of film to psychological term to pop culture term. And, and in terms of commentary, I think what struck us both on a recent rewatch is how the psychological slash pop psychological term refers not just to that moment of the gaslight turning on and off, but to the whole relationship portrayed by the movie. Yeah. And the film itself is just referring to that moment in the title. But then when you have this later adaptation of that title, it draws from all these moments within the film. I mean, it's interesting because when you watch the movie, you don't necessarily think about this, mm -hmm. but you said this as well, I think, when we talked about this, but it's a very real thing. You see light go down, mm -hmm. but it's a really great metaphor for light dimming and well, turning her light self in a way. Yeah, um, kind of putting her in the dark. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But it's brilliant enough that it's not on the nose, you're not just rolling your eyes at this. It allows you to think about this movie for longer, even if you already heard about the term gas lighting yeah definitely and like because film is a visual medium it's a useful thing to <laughs> like prove to the audience this visual proof of this psychological torture that Paula is being put through but it's also such a good example because it's a very tangible thing that is visible proof of something that's hard to see and easy to hide and it encapsulates that entire power dynamic and we'll talk more about this later yeah. and then in terms of analog adaptation the term gaslighting becomes a more general term beyond just the text itself and applies to real life relationships and situations in a variety of scenarios so something that the tape looks at is different representations of gaslighting in different movies such as like the truman show or other other examples, I can't think of any. The TV show Gaslighting. <laughs> Perfect example. But also within different interpersonal, real life interpersonal relationships. Um, but also, again, looking at political and institutional gaslighting as well. And arguably, you don't need to have seen the film to understand this term and kind of to apply it to different situations in life. Sorry, did I just make that up? What was the TV show called? I think it might have just been Gaslit or Gaslight. I don't know. I, it's fine. I think that's no, fine. No, I can't remember. <laughs> it was, it's, it's some variation on Gaslight. I can't remember what it was called, though. But it's fun. See, this is the problem with overuse of these terms when yes. they become, again, like pop culture terms. You cannot pull these apart anymore. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, we wanted to talk a little bit too about the term gaslight and mm. the diagnosis, the psychological diagnosis, in terms of how we think about in the public, how we talk about it mm. as a psychological term. Yeah, and it's so interesting that, as you've kind of been saying, the kind of pop psychological meaning of the term has become more famous than the movie itself. Which is wild. And yeah, and most people haven't seen the movie, but usually know that it originates from this movie because that image is so powerful and specific and links directly to an example of the term itself. Normally, so we just talked a bit about adaptation theory, but Sanders would argue that in normal adaptations of media, e.g. between different cultural mediums, there's this idea of challenging the idea of a fixed original text. Right. Adaptation is supposed to be creative and not just a replication. Something new comes out of it every time. And adaptation extends the pleasure of the original text so that the original is not just consumed by this ad new adaptation, but its interaction with later adaptations, quote, lies at the heart of the experience of adaptation, end quote. It's this, again, it's this interplay and it's really interesting and this kind of more, it's almost like democratic reading of these different adaptations. It's not just like one is the most important or one becomes subsumed when new ones come along. However, interesting question to ask is, when media interacts with something like the psychological field slash our understanding of abuse, are fixed meanings more important? Where it, what happens when there is this pre-reading without a quote-unquote direct reading? And when there's this interaction between psychological discourse, pop culture discourse, and cultural representations, and what is the effect of this? kind of one potential problem that we've spoken quite a lot about when this term is used more generally to talk about emotional manipulation and like having the key aspect of questioning of causing the victim to question their reality being left out and whether this gets rid of the usefulness of the term or disguises the problem it's meant to highlight yeah when I learned, studied languages at school. I remember complaining to the teacher that words like to be or to walk are always irregular verbs. Mm. And I remember she sort of replied back. She said, well, that's because that's the words that people use most often. Ooh. And so when you say the, the problem with you talked about how does, does this make this term useless mm. or less useful if we use it this much that it changes meaning. But that's also just a part of language mm. and linguistics in general that you can't really control. You can try. But I do think that that's interesting in terms of looking at how language changes almost as an adaptation, mm. because 
we use the term a lot and we don't necessarily think about the oranges or, or, or origins <laughs> of it that means that we just change it but there's mm. also just a limit to how much you can tr control that from happening in general with yeah. anything and what that does to gaslighting yes, absolutely very interesting So now we're going to talk a bit more about gaslighting in the movie itself and how the movie portrays this abusive relationship and the key aspects of gaslighting as they are portrayed within this film. And as mentioned, what's really interesting is it's the whole movie or the whole relationship portrayed by the movie yeah. that is creates this abusive dynamic, this specific abusive dynamic. It's not just the act of gaslighting. And I think something we agree is really key or this movie does really well is shows this progression into this abusive relationship and we think it's useful to think about a venn diagram of emotional abuse again we're not experts in any way shape or form but we found it useful to think about how um gaslighting in particular overlaps with other forms of emotional abuse um in certain areas but that there are key aspects that make it particularly gaslighting and not just another form of emotional abuse Yeah, especially rewatching it. I think both of us were, when we watched it the first time, we were like, oh, this is an interesting film. And then the second time you realize, oh, this is what he's doing to her. Oh, he's doing this mm -hmm. to her now. Like you start to see his strategy in a way. Mm -hmm. And so we broke that down into different aspects of the things you just talked about, like the Venn diagram of emotional abuse. And one of them is isolation. Mm. And so first I broke this down into isolation that can be sort of argued and excused as romantic or passionate. So for example, he first woos her with romance and marrying really quickly. So he legally separates mm. her and legally isolates her because she's now legally tied to him. He oversteps her wanting to be alone to think it over, to think the marriage proposal over. And again, this can be lost over as a passion, right? He just wants to be with her forever now. <laughs> and then even after the marriage, like the movie, again, I think does this very subtly, which I do think is really good. The honeymoon mm -hmm. is seemingly very isolated. He keeps walking up and down these st steps and there's a boat there. So I think you can only get there by boat. Yeah. <laughs> Were they having their honeymoon? So even that is completely separated. Yeah. They're often like when they're together and it's for most of the movie, it's Paula and Gregory together isolated on screen when you first see them together as like a couple they're boundaried off from the rest of the street by this rate that's kind of it it has that kind of like prison kind of vibe of like they're like together and they're in the secluded corner which could look very romantic it's like they're in their own little world but yet once you have that context of the rest of the film and when you re-watch it you see how these things are little early indications of oh something's not quite right here oh maybe they shouldn't be quite this isolated together and it builds into this larger thing later on. It's this metal structure that is pretty enough to make sense to just be in this place in Italy. Mm. But then when you rewatch it, you're like, oh, this is like a bird in a cage. Yes. yes. Like he's like dragging this bird into his cage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another part of the isolation is that he creates this parallel, oh, a parallel Jesus, narrative about Paula's personality. You noticed this, that he moves her from Italy where anyone would know her, like anyone else would have known her for the last, I don't know how many mm. years she's been there. Yeah. And he creates this oppositional dynamic between the servants and Paula because they work for him, not for her. Mm. And he tells them not to speak to her, but to him. And he labels her difficult and high strung to the servants before they even get to know her. And so he makes sure that the people around her already have an impression of her before they even get a chance to form their own opinions of her. Mm. And it works as well, because, I mean, initially, I think there's a scene when, like, Gregory tells Nancy that old Paul is not very well and, and she's, like, very highly strung. And then she talks to Elizabeth and is like, she doesn't look that unwell to me. But over the course of the rest of the film, Nancy absolutely plays that role where she still treats Paula like she's unwell and, and has to defer to Gregory every time and Paula has no autonomy. Yeah. And so this creates this thing where he is her only support mm. and her safety is only possible within his, again, his birdcage. Yeah. She doesn't feel safe going outside alone. Um, She had meltdowns and she begs for him to hold her and he just leaves her alone in the cage. And he makes her embarrass herself at the concert, for example. He is the only one who gets to create this reality of her mm. because she rarely steps out of the cage. But even if she does, she's still within his grasp. Mm. Yeah. And it's quite ironic that he's creating this danger for her and is the main danger in her life. But he is the thing that gives her the most feeling of safety and security. Like there's that horrible scene where he leaves her alone in her room and she's like, Gregory, please hold me. Please take me yeah. in your arms. I'm afraid. And he leaves her in her room and just like fucks up out the house. 
it's showing that power and control that he has over her and it just is that kind of sense that he's enjoying the fact that he knows that he's causing her this torture and trauma but, and he has the power to relieve her of that but won't do that because he enjoys the power that he has to manipulate her um, yeah yeah it's all pretty pretty nasty <laughs> Yeah. And again, like we talked about, one key aspect of gaslighting is like making you question your sense of reality. Mm. And, and I picked this up on the rewatch so much was the tone. Because I realized in so many scenes, she reads his tone completely correctly. He's angry, he's frustrated, but she's always told that she misunderstood it, which mm. is just... Uh, it's like okay it's brilliant on his part like I'm not calling him brilliant but the way that he's doing it mm -hmm. is because there's no way to verify who said what in what tone yeah and that is again I think one of the reasons why this keeps coming up keeps being uh, resonant with people is because people have always done this but still do this to this day argue that you misread the tone mm -hmm. not that they were being aggressive towards you and so one scene like he yelled like I don't want to want people all over this house and then he immediately calms himself and plays music to make it seem like it was nothing and when she the, because it was the bloodthirsty Bessie the neighbor who was <laughs> coming to see her and then he follows it up when she says like why didn't you let me speak to her he's like why didn't you tell me you really wanted to see her yeah. like he didn't just yell at her and very specifically verbally abused her into knowing that she doesn't get to make the call in that moment like she doesn't get to decide to see the neighbor if she wants to yeah and it's just <laughs> yeah no he always he twists it when she reads the situation correctly yes um, like he says like I thought you were only trying to be polite and he, he has this very changing mood yeah it just like the switch that happens right we both notice that he always takes down her joy right first he says they cannot go out and then he's angry at her for moving the paint and when she's like dancing around right and she's like laughing and singing and so he always has to like break her down when she's in a good mood because that is not allowed mm -hmm. yeah and the reason why the tone thing i think got me so much was because he gets to control both the reality of his tone and hers mm -hmm. so he because she doesn't have any ill will towards him like she just assumes that he wouldn't mean her any harm so he can always change the narrative of what happened afterwards because you know he could argue that uh, i just thought we didn't want to see anyone that evening and not that he verbally abused her into not being uh, able and allowed mm -hmm. to see the neighbor because it's so hard to argue for yourself after the fact if you wanted to explain the situation to someone from the outside, why take her reality over his? Because I think watching this film, I was kind of aware that he was do like something was happening, but it's quite difficult to describe. And I think laying out, she reads his tone correctly, um, and he always tells her that she's misunderstood it. That is quite hard to pin down. And even watching this film, it's quite difficult to pick that out and lay it out in quite bare terms. It was really useful to to have you define it like that. <laughs> We've all been in that situation, right, where we had to explain to someone else what happened before, mm -hmm. and we just don't have any way of proving what happened. And we just are like, no, 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 you don't understand that person, the way they talked to me. I didn't have an option to say mm -hmm. something else, to say no, to do something. And that's so hard to prove to someone else, mm -hmm. because, again, that person is, you know, oftentimes just lying about the way that they spoke to you or the way that they made you feel or something. Yeah. And I just feel like that's also why this resonates so much in terms of pop culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing that really got me was the way he jokes about stuff, because we've all been in that situation again, where someone makes a joke at you to the point where they upset you, but intentionally, mm -hmm. and then they argue after the fact that, oh, it's just because you don't have a sense of humor, or I was just kidding. Mm -hmm. And the way that he does this is this ironic joking, right? When he says, like, keeping people away from you, making you a prisoner. He ironically mentions the actual thing that he very much intends to do to her. And they want to go to a party, and he assumes that she wouldn't go without him. And then she's like, no, 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 I still want to go to this party. <laughs> and then he, like, jokes that he was like, of course I wouldn't let you go alone. Mm -hmm. Again, she read his tone correctly, yeah. because he wasn't joking. He wasn't joking. And then he's like, oh, no, no. Again, yeah. he gets to control what tone was being used. And you weren't joking. You were being serious. Yes. You were being a prick. Because he is able to joke about it, he can bring it under his own narrative. He then has control over those words, puts it in a different context, completely like you were saying about tone. And also because it's a joke. It, well, it can't be serious or true. Even though he's saying, oh, did you think I was going to make you my prisoner? He's joking. So that can't be the truth. He could also argue, like, if I really was doing that, would I say it out loud yeah. like this? And that also implies full thought and planning, and this person is malicious. Right. Which, especially if it's like your loved one, you don't want to think that they're malicious and they actually want to do these things. And which, in the case of Gregory, like, he is and does. 
It's also the thing you said before about gaslighting is about being charming, right? Mm. That's why the joking aspect is also so important. Completely. He needs to come off as charming and not just an asshole husband. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was thinking about this also in how would she be able to prove what's happening to her? Yeah. And so you have very little in terms of actual proof that isn't like tone based. <laughs> um, so the one proof that we have, I think that's a physical thing. Mm is the letter mm -hmm. um, it's in the piano when they arrive at Thornton Square. And I do think it's interesting that he doesn't destroy yeah, it. Yeah, that's a little bit like, um, it's a bit <laughs> of a plot hole. It, or very convenient, very convenient they were then able to like, yeah, corroborate and they didn't destroy yeah. it. But, but he did hide it in a locked desk so she doesn't have access mm -hmm. to it, but the letter connects him to his real name. Yeah, it's such a, it sort of feels like, why didn't he destroy it at the time? And then why did he not destroy it when he found it again? Like, that's such a damning piece of evidence. Yeah. I do think that the movie is arguing that he was more like a fanboy type person as well. Yeah. Like there is something psychological going on here in terms of his connection to Alice mm. Alquist. Because he doesn't want to destroy that connection to her. Like his sort of, yeah. his letter to her. Yeah, interesting. Because yeah. Because why else would he not just burn that thing? <laughs> Convenience yeah. plot. But yes. <laughs> yeah. And talking about two aspects that, like, do we know that this is, like, in her brain? Do we know that this is actually happening? Is the gaslight and the footsteps. And so the gaslight is not something he turns down. Mm -hmm. It dims because he turns on the light yeah. in the attic. And it's more provable than tone. But again, you need witnesses mm -hmm. and the footsteps as well. And that's why Brian comes in, in terms of the narrative of the movie and the play. And so the footsteps are really interesting because he hires Nancy, who doesn't care to protect Paula, and he specifically hires a cook who doesn't hear well, mm. right? And so you need witnesses to verify this. But in the movie, when the gaslight dims and when the footsteps appear, there's a close-up of her face. Mm. And so you don't quite know whether the movie's trying to tell you this is now from her perspective mm. or this is really happening. So those are the proof. What is she perceiving to yeah. happen or what is actually happening? And the thing that she's being accused of obviously is stealing, right? But she's allegedly stealing seemingly really small things or hiding pictures in their own house. How is that a bad thing? Uh, and I think, again, like when you watch the movie for, and the first time, I was like, okay, this is nonsense. But like, the second time, I was like, yeah, so it's not to invite others who might suspect him. He's not pretending that she steals stuff from a museum or something. Others might come in or there might be witnesses to be able to corroborate and be like, well, she wasn't even near that exhibit. Like, why would she steal that? She's only stealing small things from the house. So others cannot come in and maybe possibly figure out what he's doing. Mm. There are also things of his, which I think is interesting because legally she owns these as well yeah. yeah and the brooch is the first big thing that happens right and he specifically labels this as not monetarily valuable but it's a family heirloom so it's like emotionally very valuable and it makes her forgetfulness quote-unquote like personal matter rather than a money one yes completely it's that domestic public split it's like because they're yeah. things that belong to him and that belong kind of in the domestic sphere. That means that he has the power in that in that sphere. And so there's no power from like these outside institutions, such as the police who come in later, right. to get involved in this matter because he's the head of the household, he's the patriarch, he's the one who's it, it continues within his realm of power. And also, importantly, it means that well, there are no other third parties that would need to be involved to verify the truth. It's just his truth that's important. And I guess it also manipulates her in a way that because again, it's things that are kind of personal, they have a sentimental value. It manipulates her into thinking that she is hurting him as well, which is just quite a, a twisted element of it as well. That it's not even so evil. Yeah, it's not even her things often, although sometimes it is. Like the fact that it's things that belong to him, and so she then becomes full of guilt for like impacting him and hurting him. I think the domestic thing you said is super important because that is how so much domestic abuse doesn't get dealt with. It's because everyone always says like, well, deal with it in the family. Mm. Or like, this is a personal, private matter behind closed doors. No one else needs to like get involved in order to save this person or protect this woman or whatever. Yeah. It's the reason why the whole of the personal and political is such an important statement. Yeah. The thing too that I wanted to dive into a little bit more is like the idea of health, mm. which is being used against her. And so mental health is often categorized as this invisible sickness, right? There was also like a hashtag that went viral a couple of years ago, maybe he doesn't hit you type stuff, mm. right? 
the mental health thing is like that you cannot specifically point to her having something visible for yeah. us. I'm not saying that mental health manif uh, doesn't manifest physically because it very much does. He is seemingly caring about her trauma associated with the house. That's why he moves the furniture into a place where he can search it in secret. So he cares enough about her trauma to know that she has had this really traumatic, she's had this really horrible experience of finding her dead aunt there, right? But even that is just so he can like, get to the jewels somehow. Yeah. Like That's why he wants to move all the furniture to the attic. It's nothing to do with like caring for her and you said this before but when she begs him to like, hold her mm -hmm. and she goes you must bear with me she takes responsibility in that she voices needing something for being mm -hmm. unwell like when she speaks she takes responsibility for that and he just continuously takes down her joy and always frames it as like caring for her health i'm afraid you're far from well enough for theater being like it's not that i don't let you go it's not that you shouldn't go it's that i'm afraid you're far mm. from well enough he pretends to be worried about her and so when she says like do you think i'm lying do you think i'm stealing he's like that's what i'm trying not to tell myself mm. like it's hard for him to get to that conclusion yeah. that he worked towards the entire time and it makes her like the one who has to name it as well so it's as if it's her idea yes and she's coming to these conclusions because it's the truth she's verifying that truth yeah he's like setting the trap so she can trap herself mm. and she could label it versus him just throwing her in the cage yeah and she says like do you think i'm lying and he's like it's worse than lying and implying the necessity of medical intervention and he also ties it to like a family history of mental illness which again this is something you cannot tie down like you could accuse anyone of having a, fa a family history of mental illness and let's be real also most people just do like mental illness is not like, a rare thing right mm -hmm. but specifically that allows him to further institutionalize her possibly when he just mentions yeah her mother also had issues or something like that and there's no way to verify that because you cannot prove that you're well in a way mentally <laughs> like the more someone tells you to calm down the more angry you're gonna get you know what mm. i mean yeah and it's so horribly on the rewatch how deeply disgusting his abuse is because he uses her asking for help as a reason to institutionalize her mm. and there's just absolutely no love or care for her in this despite her asking for help and he gets to put himself almost as the savior or like the sad husband who just did ha didn't have any other choices and it's so sad that he had to do this, right? Mm. But the reason this really pisses me off is it's so hard admitting that you need help. And people always talk about like, if you need help, you just need to reach out for it. But it's so complicated and to ask for help. And yeah. the fact that there are systems in place to institutionalize someone and allow you to abuse someone institutionally mm. that don't protect you, that don't give you help, but just institutionalize you. And this movie is so deeply disturbing and sadly that still happens, right? And that has never stopped happening. And that is so much more disgusting when, when a loved one is like a person using systems that are, exist in society to institutionalize you. Yeah. And it's just, oh, that mm. drove me so crazy watching it for the third time. <laughs> He's creating this reality where, again, she's talking about the gaslight dimming and the footsteps. And like, like, that's the whole thing, right? That's the whole like proof you have. And he just completely dismisses that, even though he's the one doing it, mm. even inadvertently. Yeah. And we've talked about him dimming the gaslights before and kind of how that's a good kind of representation of all of these things that we've been talking about, the kind of manipulation and abuse that go that is going on in that relationship. But it's also interesting that kind of this turning down the gaslights, it's not even intentional on his part. It's the effect of something. It's a symptom. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. It's a symptom of something that's deeper that's going on. And because of his manipulation, he can get away with it. But it's not even necessarily something he's aware of. I think he'd be aware of the fact that his footsteps might make some noise again. Yeah. Hiring Elizabeth, who is hard of hearing. But the fact that the gaslights turn down, it's not even clear that he knows that those gaslights go down. It's almost something that slips through the net, but is that kind of very visual key clue to the fact that something is going on here. Very, very briefly, if you haven't seen the movie, the mm -hmm. thing is that in those old houses, when one person turns on the gas like in the kitchen or whatever, it goes down in other parts. Mm -hmm. And that's why the gaslight dims when he turns it on in the attic. Because you might think like, why would the gaslight turn down just because he turns it on in another room? Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's just kind of symptom of something deep that's going on. And it may be one of the reasons why this term is so popular. It's because it kind of helps to define something that's really intangible by having a very tangible kind yeah. of clue of what that looks like. And also the fact that it's a thing that he doesn't control. Uh, and it's a thing that in the end kind of gets him caught. It's a thing that like breaks Paul out of that trap is the fact that Brian comes in and says like, oh, the gaslight has gone down. She's like, yes, that's what I've been saying. <laughs>
You can see it too. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's also important how the film kind of subtly emphasises and acknowledges emotional violence as a form of violence. Um, yeah. There's a scene in the Tower of London where Paula and Gregory go to the Tower of London on kind of like a tourist trip. And Gregory's really interested in the crown jewels and has this fascination with them, which kind of foreshadows his interest in Paula's family jewels. Um, but at the same time, there's this kind of juxtaposition between these beautiful jewels and the violence of um, the Tower of London that mirrors their relationship. So you have, like again, these beautiful jewels, um, which in their own way have like a whole historical context of violence and colonisation that kind of brought them to this country. And then also in that same setting, you have this story, horrible torture and death at the Tower of London. Yeah, and it's like as a setting being treated as like a tourist attraction, yeah. you know, just something fun to do in an afternoon. Yeah, exactly. And there's a key moment in the tower when there's um, some tour guide who is narrating the history of the Tower of London and the different kind of torture and death that would happen in this place. And as the narration is going on, Paula like looks in her purse and realizes the brooch is missing. And like she's becoming more and more distressed as this narration is happening. She takes herself off to the side. And you can see the parallel of kind of physical torture as described by the tour guide and the kind of mental torture that Paula is experiencing like, as she's searching for this brooch. And I think that undercurrent of violence um, is really key because Gregory is never kind of physically violent with Paula. We never see him be physically violent with her, but there's always this threat, this underlying threat of physical violence yeah. lying under the surface. It's always like just about to happen. Yeah. So this emotional abuse is itself violence. And then there's also this threat of physical violence. So at the end of the film, we find that there is a gun. Gregory keeps a gun in his dresser. And that's sort of a kind of big, big red flag. Um, that perhaps he'd use that gun. He also, there's this shot when Brian confronts Gregory the camera kind of has this close-up shot on his hands behind his back and he makes his clenched fist um, and it's sort of an indication that he's going to get physically violent. Not to mention the fact that Gregory also already killed Paula's <laughs> aunt. Like, he, str he literally strangled her aunt. Um, yeah, so, he has already committed yeah, murder. Yeah, he's like. <laughs> very capable of violence. He's, he's, yeah, he's literally murdered someone. And he's also very up for the idea of... Inst he wants to institutionalise Paula. That's his ultimate plan, really, is to get her out of the picture, either by physical violence or by institutional violence, which in itself is kind of a physical violence. Like locking someone up, literally. Yeah, um, and taking away their autonomy. The film does a good job of highlighting emotional violence as violence, and also the underlying physical violence of this emotional violence as well. Yeah. Also, it's just the coldness of murdering someone and then moving into that house. I know! <laughs> Like, I sometimes go, I'm sometimes on street corners where I said something embarrassing five years ago, you know, and I'm like, oh my god, I need to get out of here. Like, <laughs> I know. It's interesting. And it, yeah, and it's interesting that it's kind of, it's obviously not a supernatural horror film or anything, but it's a psychological no, right. horror film. But there's a sense that Paula is being haunted by this house and by the ghost of the past that is Gregory, who's kind of invaded this house space. Interesting. Sorry, I used the word invaded. Interesting. We'll talk a bit more about Gregory as the kind of foreigner. A little bit later. Yeah, interesting. But, <laughs> but then also Gregory doesn't seem... He's haunted by the jewels, I guess. That's sort of shown to be his fascination. He's just so invested in getting these jewels that he'll do anything to get them. Invested is a good way of referencing <laughs> it because he killed someone for it and he didn't even get to them yet. Yeah. No, he's sunk a lot of... It's <laughs> sunk loss fallacy. Is that yeah. what it is? That, <laughs> well, I've, I've come this far. I've literally murdered a person. So I might as well go the whole hog and gaslight her niece. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Marry her and everything. Jesus. Yes. Yeah. So like we said before, we were talking about gaslighting here a lot. And I did want to talk a little bit about therapy speak, because mm. reading up on gaslighting and stuff, there were a lot of articles talking about the discourse around the term gaslighting and the mainstreaming of so-called therapy speak. So, so what, yeah. what is therapy speak? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> So therapy speak is, for example, terms like psychopath, trauma, trauma bonding, boundaries, trigger, toxic, narcissist. So you probably have heard terms like this, and maybe you've never looked up specifically what they mean. When we started this podcast, we also talked about not wanting to use terms like crazy or stupid because of the discrimination that is associated with them. And 
just not wanting to be ableist, not wanting to be discriminatory in our language. And one of the arguments that is being made about terms that within therapy speak is that these are terms that are existing in clinical literature and also mainstream vernacular. And mm -hmm. they have expansive and expanding definitions like we talked about before. Language changes when people use it. Mm -hmm. So narcissism, for example, is a diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis. But it's also something that people use to describe someone who is manipulative and selfish. Like people said this about, again, Trump is a great example of this. People called him like a psychopath, a sociopath, a narcissist and all that. And we wanted to sort of go down the rabbit hole a little bit of like what was in these articles about the consequence of mainstreaming terms like these. And I think one of the good aspects of this could be that people can recognize signs of being manipulated, right? Yeah. And they can also use terms like boundaries to improve their communication with their partners. Like these are boundaries for me. But then also terms get muddled in their meaning. So narcissism yeah. becomes selfishness with evil intent. Gaslighting becomes manipulated. I'm watching a Korean series called Live Your Own Life right now. It's just so funny while we were researching this. The newest episode I watched, they used the term gaslighting. And also, again, incorrectly, they were talking about uh. emotional manipulation, but no one was gaslighting anyone. And Taylor Swift used the term gaslighting quite recently in her interview for Time magazine when she was named Person of the Year. And this is dangerous for marginalized populations, like the term grooming, for example, is currently being used against queer people. So they get muddled in their meaning, possibly these terms. But people who don't have access to mental health care or not adequate mental health care mm. or intersectionally... Yeah appropriate mental health care and people who aren't being taken seriously by healthcare systems due to patriarchy and white supremacy, because these terms become a mainstream, they can maybe start to educate themselves and develop a better understanding of their experiences. Because I mean, there's literally medical gaslighting. You can literally be gaslit by medical systems and by doctors and not taking you and your pain or your experiences mm -hmm. with your body seriously. Yeah. And I think also these terms do describe things that happen to real people. So yeah. surely, at least to some extent, they should be used in these contexts and not like locked away in an ivory tower where they're helping no one. The point of having language is to use it to a certain extent as well especially in the context where it matters. Yeah. And we're yeah. going to link the articles, but the main focus of these articles that are talking about the dangers of therapy speak, two from Vox and one from The Guardian that I read. And I feel like they only, like you said, the ivory tower thing, these articles always argue against the public and not mm. at the institutions. And that really bothers me because I feel like that's so punching mm -hmm. down. Because yeah. in one of the articles, they quote a therapist saying, which I do think is true, right? The therapist says, a friend can be selfish and not a narcissist. You can feel stressed out without experiencing trauma. A partner can lie without gaslighting. Instead, mental health professionals urge you should embrace nuance and avoid pathologizing normal, albeit annoying or painful behavior. And so the therapist argues that people should opt to describe the situation versus using the psychological term. Mm. But I feel like that's talking from someone who's listening to someone describe their life to a therapist. And I agree when you describe something to a therapist, you shouldn't maybe say, hey, I'm being gaslit. You should maybe describe what's specifically happening, mm. right? And I do agree there is annoying, painful behavior that isn't gaslighting or that isn't that level of bad. And that isn't accurately defined by like these terms that is a separate thing i guess yeah but yeah. again we started off by reading you the definition from the american mm. psychological association they love to say that this is <laughs> both a term that exists in clinical literature uh -huh. but it's actually a colloquialism so you want to have it both ways yeah and also the fact that it has existed in clinical literature even if it's not necessarily associated with it now it's at one point it was considered a psychological term yeah. enough to be used in papers it is that an unclear sort of space it's quite muddy sort of what exactly it means and where it sits it's in a gray area and you like mm. it being in the gray area as long as you as the institution get to define whether it's appropriate to use you or not but the people can't yeah no it's true it's that power dynamic of who gets to decide what this meaning is and how that then plays out when you use it in a different way and and like can you even control it as we've been saying can you control how language is used oh i don't know i'm going off on a tangent but yes i agree 
And because we argue about stuff like this all the time, right? I don't know, someone calls themselves a feminist and then you go, but you're not feminist because of X, Y, Z. I do understand the want and need to define terms to a specific thing. I think that what these articles and these therapists don't look at is why do people use these terms? Yeah. Why do people feel the need to use gaslighting instead of someone is questioning my reality or making me question my reality? Why are people talking about trauma? I think it's because someone might be scared, for example, of water. But if they say that, then people are like, oh, come on, get over yourself. Just get in the water. But if they say that I have maybe trauma, mm. then they might be taken more seriously. And I think, mm. again, look at why are people doing this, especially as psychologists. Isn't that the whole thing? Yeah. Why people are using these terms. Mm. And... I would also argue you started this because you borrow terms from media like gaslight or mm. Greek myths like narcissus. You use pop culture terms and them having multiple meanings is inevitable because these are stories. These are not mm. clinical studies. You didn't name gaslighting after the first psychologist who came up with the term. There isn't like a doctor gaslight. You used a <laughs> play or a slash a movie. You specifically used a Greek myth to describe something because you thought it would make it more easily understandable. And And now you're mad that this has multiple meanings because people don't necessarily have ever read the quote unquote original myth of narcissus. Narcissus. I mean, it's also narcissus. It is a myth. It's not like narcissus was a clinically diagnosed narcissist in right? this particular way. It's yeah. It's so like imagine again, someone. Sorry, someone is a narcissist <laughs> because they fell in water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because they are a supernatural being who, yeah, fell in love with their own reflection. I'm sure that, again, I'm not I'm not a psychologist and I haven't studied this, but I'm sure that from some research I've done on different kind of old like psychological stuff, medical stuff, it doesn't stay the same over a long period of time. Our understanding yes. of narcissism at the start of the 20th century is probably a very long way from what it is now. Even within the psychological field, these meanings are not going to stay the same. They are going to shift. Yeah, and not necessarily good or bad, right? They understand more cultural differences between the way that people experience certain things because of class, race, gender, all these things. But that is such a good point. Even within the medical community, these things don't stay fixed in one definition of it. But I think it's really interesting because even people who've seen the movie misremember Gregory. Like I've seen so many people be online talk about people don't really know what this term means. But actually in the original movie, it's about the fact that he turns down the light and then tells her that he didn't. That's not what happens. I do agree that people should stop using terms then when they don't know the meaning and the significance. But within these articles that I just mentioned, they also use the term Stockholm Syndrome. That's not a real thing. There was a made up term describing police frustration with hostages who called out police incompetence during a hostage negotiation. There's a You're Wrong About episode about this. Like uh, We can absolutely link that. And also under one of the stills they used in the Vox article of Gregory threatening Paula, they called Gregory a sociopath. Did they check that with a therapist before they put that in the article? Like, is Gregory yeah. a sociopath? I feel like people both want to say you don't get to use this term without specifically getting a medical diagnosis, but I get to use these terms. Mm. And yeah. I think that that's really, really dangerous. And I find that, I don't know, not even going to gatekeepy, but just very arrogant. Definitely. So talking again about the original, like we said, we don't want to put it on pedestal, but when we talk about the film, what is something we could say we learned from looking at gaslighting through the lens of this film specifically? Yeah, one of the really useful things about the movie is that it shows this full picture of gaslighting. It shows how the sort of these green flags become red flags, to, yeah. to use more therapy speak. Um, but, how, <laughs> <laughs> but how, yeah, how that kind of abusive relationship develops over time and how it develops into a particular form of ma manipulation around her sense of reality. I think one of the very subtle things that happens at the start is that Paula says that she wants to go away on her own for a bit and just think through their upcoming marriage and he's like of course yeah I, re I respect your boundaries go off and do your thing and then doesn't respect her boundaries and joins her and then won't leave her alone for like five minutes she gets the train journey and that's it and then he's like in her space all of the time and it's one of those things that in any other movie would be and if you didn't know where this movie was going you might be like oh but what a romantic gesture of passion and love and it's just because he can't bear to be away from her But then when you know the context of the film, full movie, and if you know the context of the term gaslighting, it becomes clearer that that's another form of just subtly crossing her boundaries, making sure that he's the most important thing in her life and not giving her any space to herself. So watching the film gives that full context to the term 
which even though it maybe it's gone on to mean slightly different things, it's actually quite nice to go back and see that rooted example of what does an interpersonal relationship that involves gaslighting look like. I'm just thinking about Bloodthirsty Bessie is also one of the people that keeps being kept away as the one outsider. Mm. Because you talked about that train journey being like the only time she gets to be away from him in that time. Yeah. That's the only person she meets in that time who could give her an outside perspective. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And while at the end of the film, Paula is arguably rescued by Brian. Yeah. Another thing that I think the film does quite well is that it shows Brian letting Paula come to her own conclusions and guiding her to those conclusions, but not like telling her what's happening to her. He doesn't go in there and say like, your husband's abusing you. You need to come out right now. He talks her through. He verifies her reality. He says the gaslight's just gone down and he finds her evidence so that she comes to those conclusions about her relationship with Gregory, which is like, according to, again, I'm not an expert, but I have done some bystander intervention training around domestic violence. And that is the thing that you're supposed to do with people experiencing domestic violence is not just tell them what to think, but kind of be around them, kind of help them come to their own conclusions. Like that's actually how you're supposed to handle that situation. And I think the film does quite a nice job of portraying that as well. That's also something I realized on the rewatch, because we watched this together the first time. And on the rewatch, I was like, oh, it's so nice that he's not just like, because he could just storm in there and just pick her up and drag her out. Yeah, and be like the hero. And yeah, yeah. it's still very propaganda, this film. Mm. (laughs) But also, I love the fact that how much propaganda also involves just showing how incompetent the police are because the murder case was so mishandled. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Another thing which I found really problematic in this film Mm. is that, I know, problematic. It does do this weird Mm. thing of the fear of the foreigner. And Gregory has a weird accent, I would say. It's not quite placeable. Mm. And I do wonder whether this was, not intentionally on the film's part, but just this weird anti-Eastern European racism. Because they do talk about this happening in Prague. They cast a French-American actor, but because he also has a wife in Prague, it is labeled like he's an Eastern European. And he Mm. has this shifty personality. And you don't know specifics about his background. And you have the ambiguous accent. Accent. And I feel like this is using very xenophobic tropes. Yeah, and he's a villain and he's violent. Yeah. And he's after the money. Yeah, um, greedy, right? Greedy, yeah. And it's when you're seeing those first moments of their relationship, if you're tapped into those xenophobic tropes, then you're like, oh, I wonder if he'll end up being the bad guy. Yeah. And sure enough. Also against the backdrop of the Swedish, Western European, mm. right? And she's often shown in white or having a very pale face and pale hair. Yeah. And sort of like beautiful innocence. Um, yeah. Again, whether that's intentional or not, it's still like, ugh. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. Big ugh. Because they could have just made him British. That would have made no change to anything. Yeah. But again, also in the backdrop of it's like the Second World War and there's a fear of the foreigner and yep. yeah, all that kind of stuff feeding into the film and what it decides to portray. The movie does end on that's the most let down that you start again at the end with a romance yeah. like you start at the on the roof with brian and talking about like there's going to be light again there's going to be morning again but you know that those two are going to end up together yeah <laughs> what does uh, blood at first you best see? So she's like good goodness gracious or something i can't remember what she says but she has a gasp or something yeah when she sees them on the roof it's quite funny i think she has the last line in the film i think yeah mm-hmm. also not funny, but horrible side note. It's horrible because the police have massively high rates of domestic violence. Mm, yeah. Mind you, that's reported domestic abuse. Yeah. Which yeah. is also kind of why the propaganda ending doesn't work because, you know, mm. <laughs> maybe don't date a cop next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think the take highlights how in previous representations of gaslighting, the victims are generally saved by an outside party, which is usually the police. And they argue that it's become more about individuals rescuing themselves, usually young women rescuing themselves, which I think we slightly disagree with. And we think that a lot of it is still a reliance on the police to kind of empower the individual to save themselves from their situation, which can end up being quite girl bossy. Um, As the saying goes, gaslight, gatekeep, girl boss. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, the show is called Unbelievable. Ah, That's what I was talking about. And that's the one with where the police... She ends up like with some female cops and they sort of rescue her. So that what happens. Yeah. So in the show, she gets assaulted, sexually assaulted, and then she reports it. And then the police force her into admitting that she made it up and mm. claiming like a false report. And she then gets sentenced based on that. And that throws her into a super abusive system, right? Because she's now labeled as someone who lied about sexual assault. And the reason that this gets uncovered is because of these female cops. 
Mm. Yeah. So you again, you have the cops to the rescue of solving a problem that the police created in the first place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, so you kind of have these either individualizing narratives where it's the, in the Truman Show, for example, it's like that one individual kind of gets himself. Well, still arguably there's other people involved, but still it's individualizing narrative person gets himself out of the situation, saves himself or kind of reinforcing a reliance on state state structures, particularly the police. And I think just to go on a slight tangent, but kind of related, all of the definitions of gaslighting often really focus on the kind of interpersonal between two people. Yeah. Um, so, um, but I think even in the film Gaslighting, it already indicates that it's not just about just two people in a relationship. It's also about the wider community and how either there's a lack of interaction and a lack of intervention and it's that wider aspect that's also a part, like these kind of wider relationships that are also a part of this, like quite this tight knit domestic relationship. Yeah, yeah. So we've already talked about how Gregory gets Nancy on his side, as well as Elizabeth to not verify Paula's truth. Paula has a lack of people around her who she can trust and who can verify her reality. And there's also, like as you said, bloodthirsty Bessie, this character who's like Mrs. I think Mrs. Thwaites is her name. And she's this um, neighbour of Fuller and Gregory's in Thornton Square. Um, and she's very interested in, she really loves murder narratives and she's very into sensational stories. And when Paula first meets her, she's reading her bloodthirsty novel and that's how she gets her name, Bloodthirsty Bessie. And she's very interested in what happened in Thornton Square, what happened to Paula's aunt, but in a very sensationalist way. Um, so that she's true more crime. interested. Yeah, that very true. true crime very friend. true. <laughs> and she's sort of nosy and interested, but not necessarily, or at least in the way I think the film portrays her as trying to portray her, she's not necessarily actually looking to look after Paula. She's more just wants to be part of the story. Unlike Brian, for example, who wants to rescue Paula or get her out of that situation. And so I think the film already kind of shows that it's not just these two people that are important to think about. It's also everyone outside the situation who could potentially intervene and what kind of happens to stop that from happening be that kind of an interest in a sensational story wanted to keep their job which i think you could do quite a lot of analysis on class and stuff in this movie as well which we won't go into but there's a whole lot of stuff you could say about elizabeth and also nancy and being on the side of gregory so yeah paula has no community to rely on which i think is a key aspect of gaslight however you can compare this to the 2023 film they clone tyrone and how that film looks at gaslighting and community also just in general we would both recommend watching the 2023 they clone tyrone that mm. movie got so little attention because it came out on the same day as oppenheimer and barbie yeah but that movie is brilliant and i really wish more people would watch it yeah it's a really really good film highly recommend it and i'm going to be discussing some spoilers but it's not it's not too spoilery but still is spoilers so maybe yeah. skip this part or just go watch it and then come back so at the start of they clone tyrone the three main characters played by john boyega jamie fox and Tiona paris are all these individuals trapped in an abusive structure and they don't work together and john boyega's character ends up being killed in this scenario and none of them is working with each other or for each other um, but when they form into a group they're able to uncover and challenge gaslighting that they've been institutionalized into and further on, as a result, create this community uprising, which then escalates from there. And it's interesting, it's more of a revolutionary politics, which I think comes from a distrust of institutions due to institu an understanding of institutional racism and how white supremacy is embedded into US society. So I think this example helps to expand this understanding of gaslighting within an institutional context and how community can be used to challenge gaslighting in this way. And again, we can link it back to adaptation theory and look at how it's not just the original text that defines this term, but if we look at different representations across pop culture, not just in psychological discourse, but within, again, movies and media, that helps to redefine and expand our understanding of this definition of gaslighting. I just keep thinking about this also in terms of, like, you need community, you need a group to fight a system, because mm. if patriarchy wasn't a thing, Paula wouldn't be as... Mm. As, because you talked about white supremacy, right? But the patriarchy is so important in how Paula is tied yeah. into this whole thing. Again, it's that patriarchal nuclear family type thing where it's the man of the house is in charge of that house, even though it's her money. And again, there's lots you could say about <laughs> her house. Exactly. But because they're married, her property is his property. And again, it's this larger institution that makes that abuse possible in the first place because they're so isolated within this house and because they don't have that wider community around them and because... 
he's the man of the house so he can get the servants on side and have that kind of power over everyone in the house. Which again, mm. I only noticed on the rewatch when you try to pay attention to very small details. But when they enter the house, she's handed the key. And then later, because of the class that they're in, she cannot enter the house without Nancy. Yeah. Even though when they start, it's her key because it's her house. She's the one mm. who inherited the house. But because of patriarchy, it's then his house. And because of the class that they're in, those type of people don't open their own doors. <laughs> So she cannot get into the house without Nancy. Yeah. But who gets to leave this cage? The dynamic shifts so much. Yeah, yeah definitely. Which is why, again, watch They Clone Tyrone. It's great. So having looked at... Um, all of this. All of this. <laughs> having looked at all of this and having analyzed gaslight and the term gaslighting and how it pops up throughout culture and looking at that from an adaptation theory lens... What are our conclusions? Overall, maybe what we can sort of distill this down to is that maybe it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Watching the movie adds another dimension to our understanding of the term gaslighting. And thinking in terms of adaptation theory also helps us understand gaslight as not just coming from one place or another, but refracted through all of these lenses. But But, um, (laughs) maybe kind of just like, like anything with language, maybe this is always going to be a challenge. As we've said, you cannot control language. It's going to be used, and if as it's used, it changes and adapts. Especially with this interplay between popular culture and psychological discourse, it means that our understanding of this term and how it's implemented and used has to grow together. It can't. If it grows apart, then you just end up with, like, people are going to be using the term in a completely different way anyway, and the psychological aspect almost doesn't matter if this is how the public are yeah. going to be using it. And I think... Again, if you don't want pop culture to have a point of view psychological terms, maybe don't take psychological terms from pop culture. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I do think that pop culture can help us explore the different kinds of gaslighting. And there are multiple adaptations Mm. since 1944 of this play and this movie, different Mm. versions of it. I mean, the problem with pop culture in general can be that pop culture means it also is consumable and it becomes a product, Mm. meaning that... You know, these words, I mean, we've all seen dudes that should not have feminist (laughs) t-shirts. And I mean, you said this before, you know, gaslight, uh, gatekeep, girl boss, like, that is maybe not what we want to do with terms like this. (laughs) I've only ever seen it used in, yeah, as in ironic. I'm guessing that came about as an ironic thing, but we can see where that yeah. leads to. <laughs> we can see where it leads. Yeah, we can see where it, that kind of that irony comes from as well. Yeah, I would argue that these terms can be manipulated quite badly, and yes, that can mean that people don't understand the term properly. But again, who's gonna be the gatekeeper of that? <laughs> I agree. I do think that this is a very important movie in terms of understanding and Mm. depicting domestic abuse and patriarchy. And I do think that in Mm -hmm. that, I think I highly recommend it. Also, because movies like this can be super preachy. And I think that this movie doesn't do that, even though it's very specifically talking about showing you domestic abuse. It isn't Mm. preachy. Not that that's the worst thing to be. But I do think that, again, we talked about this showing the steps really well. And you can then also explore this with other movies, which I do think are important to understand manipulation. Like Stafford Wise is a really great movie to show this kind of abuse that can happen behind closed doors in the domestic sphere, Mm. especially when that's being labeled as a post-racial, post-feminist, post-da-da-da-da-da. This argument that equality has been achieved so we can look back Mm. on this now and we can pat ourselves on the back and how dangerous that is. And I think that's why Stafford Wise is a really great example or Rosemary's Baby, which are both books written by Ira Levin. This guy really dove into these topics quite well and quite interestingly. And more recently, again, spoiler, <laughs> but mm-hmm. example of gaslighting would be the movie The Girl on the Train. Yeah. Completely. And also in general, I'm glad for all of these articles that ask therapists how to deal with therapy speak, but I would like people to be a little bit more critical of institutions and systems rather than the public when we discuss who gets to use what terms because who is in power here Mm. yeah yeah and who gets to make these decisions and even if an institution does make this decision does it actually work out in the practical day-to-day what is actually happening with language i think that's so important when you said that before this is something that happens to real people this is Mm. interpersonal experiences of people that is important yeah so our ending thought we'd just like to ask you our listeners if you've watched the film Do you find the film helpful in your understanding of gaslighting? Has it changed your understanding of gaslighting? Do you understand what gaslighting is? I feel like hopefully by the end of this episode you do. Um, But yeah, no, it would be really interesting to hear your thoughts on this movie and how it interacts with your understandings. Yeah. But yeah. So... 
So at this point in the episode, we always give a recommendation on a piece of media that we've been enjoying recently and that we think that more people should experience and enjoy. Where would you go first? Oh, that's so nice. So <laughs> I would like to recommend, and I know I've recommended stuff by them before, but Julian Baker, Phoebe Bridges, and Lucy Dacus Yay. as Boy Genius, because I've been listening to the record over and over again. But I want to specifically recommend their latest EP called The Rest, which I think are Ooh. just songs that they didn't include on the record. It's four uh-huh. songs, I think. But I've been listening to those over and over and over again last week and like the weeks before, just feeling my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize, I think maybe I'd seen it once and then was like, oh, I need to listen to that. And I haven't listened to it yet. So thank you. Yeah. Um, because I'll, now I will go and listen to that. Thank you so much. That'll take me the rest of the month to listen to you probably. It's, it's not four that songs. Lesson. That's the thing. That's also why I thought it maybe would be a good recommendation because sometimes a whole album is so much. Like four songs. It's just an EP, but it's really, really good. Cool. Thank you so much. I've already recommended this to you, Anna, or told you that I've seen it, but I'd like to recommend the documentary Your Fat Friend by Jeannie Finley, Ooh. which follows writer, podcaster, and activist Aubrey Gordon. I got to see a preview of this at the Watershed in Bristol on Monday a couple of weeks ago, and Aubrey Gordon and Jeannie Finley were there um, in the room. Brag. And somebody, we did, yeah, <laughs> we, there was a Q&A afterwards and someone asked them, if you were a seagull for a day, who would you shit on? <laughs> um <laughs> It's just the I best just question. Them. I know. I'm like, that's that, they won't have heard that one before, but it's great. That, that's also kind of what the public want to know. You know, that's that's exactly what I want. I didn't know I needed to know that, but I did. And just so everybody knows, Aubrey's answer was Piers Morgan. So now you know. But yeah, it's a really good film. It aims to create a paradigm shift in the way that we view fat people and the fat in our own bodies. Yeah, I've been following. I think because Anna recommended to me, you're wrong about the podcast, which features. Michael Hobbs, who then went on to start with Aubrey Gordon, um, the Maintenance Phase podcast, which is all about kind of like diet culture and like myths around food and fatness and sort of bunking those things and looking at the kind of science and methodologies behind it. It's a really good podcast, really recommend it. But I'm familiar with her work through that and the documentary, without giving too much away, does talk quite a lot about her work and it follows her journey. But it's all really sensitive and it's really funny as well because it's Aubrey Gordon. She's just really funny and it's really insightful. So I'd really recommend it as a film when it comes out on. I haven't looked up when it like comes out. Let me just when you like pay attention to movies. Oh, this movie came out and it's like oh, this is going to be in cinemas in eight months. But it's recommend <laughs> it's nominated for the awards now because it premiered on a festival eight months ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think it's coming out in February. I think that's when it actually comes out. Let me just double check. I just really want to watch um, it. <laughs> It's good. It's really good. I missed the start of it because I had to run from work and I was late. But luckily, because they had a little intro, I only missed like 10 minutes at the start. Um, when does it come out? Tomorrow. In... No. And and also, I didn't know that, I think I might have said this to you already, Anna, but Jeannie Finley also did Seahorse, the documentary about the trans man who decides to give birth. And I remember that coming out in 2019 and I didn't watch it. But I was like, oh my god, it's the same person who did that documentary. That's really cool. I remember hearing about that, but I didn't watch that one either. Again, because you watch so much stuff and then you just... So so many things just fall by the wayside. Yeah. But I'm really, I really want to watch that. And it's reminded me that it exists. So that's good as well. 9th of February, 2024. It releases in the UK. I don't know about anywhere else. But yeah, great recommendation. I'm really looking forward to that. And yeah. Also, just in general, I love when they ask people more useful questions at these like press junkets. <laughs> yeah, that was I think that was the highlight of the questions. I can't remember what Jeannie Finley said. There was also Naomi, what's her name? The person who wrote The Power, the book The Power. I don't know. Was there as well. Alderman? Naomi Alderman. And yes, she was there as well and she was very good. But yeah, anyway, I'd recommend that. That's my recommendation. Okay, awesome. You have something to listen to and something to watch. Yeah. And we would like to ask you to please rate us on iTunes. Um, please share our episode. Get in touch with us. Tag us if you listen to our episodes. Uh, you can link us on social media. We're Liliana Pod on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. We post clips of, of upcoming and existing episodes on there. Yeah. And we're so Liliana's pre rate media take on Tumblr. All of these are in the description, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to end this episode on? A joke. Oh, God. Okay. Um, how many narcissists does it take to t- change a light bulb? I don't know, Anna. How many narcissists does it take to change a light bulb? Narcissists don't use light bulbs. They use gaslighting. Hey. Ah. <laughs> <laughs>